Mm. And the news gang is back. So this week we've had two former chief justices speaking about the 40 judges. And uh, I think we can listen to what uh, the latest one of them to speak, uh, uh, David Maraga, has been saying. He said something about uh, what parliament should do with the president in light of what has happened with those nominations and the subsequent appointment of 40. Uh, sorry, 34 out of 40. We will not have a judiciary. The judges will be there. Kesi yekikuta kutini, judge ya naangalia na sema, hii kesi nikikata na muna hii, raisi yao wasiri fulani atasema nini. Uwacha ni, ni, ni one vire nafanya na muna hii. Is that the country you want us to, to live in? All right, so, so, so ladies and gentlemen, that was um, David Maraga uh, coming just a day after his predecessor had made uh, s similarly unflattering remarks uh, following the president's decision not to gazette the names of those six uh, judicial officers who had been named to, to, to various offices, including the four that were supposed to go to the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. But these uh, very stinging uh, statements, Linus, I will start with you, um, coming from retired CJs. Yes, indeed, and um, therein lies the big problem, because these two are regarded as very, very authoritative voices they are speaking from retirement. And uh, in terms of um, how they have, the, the thought process of just weighing what they have to say, you can't accuse the two of not doing their homework. You can't accuse the two of not weighing what they have to say. And uh, I, I, I think someone in KTN, uh, the, the station that did the interview yesterday, did clarify that the interview with David Marago was actually booked for Monday, long before, yeah. long before uh, uh, Mutunga made his statement, and so there's absolutely no relationship between what it was not coordinated. I think these two just chose to speak about the ongoing uh, events, and look, they are not complementary of this administration. They are not complementary of the president and his handling of this uh, affair, and. Uh, there are two things that emerge there. First is, it's very, very clear that in terms of how the communication is carried out in this government, there is a breakdown. Because I would have imagined, or someone would have supposed, that retired chief justices can actually place a call and have an, an audience, private audience with the president, and tell them, tell him uh, their, their concerns. But is this possible? I don't think so. Going by how the entire story of the judiciary versus executive battles have been carried out, they have been really played out in the media. Uh, it's their only, uh, seemingly, their only channel of communication. They have to come to cameras and, 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 and say these things. You know very well David Maraga, uh, uh, former Chief Justice, he had to go to those steps of um, the Supreme Court to talk about budget cuts, mm. to talk about the choking uh, of, uh, of the judiciary by the executive and, and, and all this. So that there is an illustration, and an unfortunate one, illustration of lack of access, lack of an avenue between uh, eminent Kenyans to have a discussion in, uh, behind <coughs> closed doors. Because this can look really tidy if the president sat with either one or both of the chief justices. But we also have camera evidence of, of both sides, basically, showing very well that the relationship cannot allow that kind of interaction. You can see the president is quite dismissive of, uh, of, of David Maraga, and, and he has made no reference to um, Mutunga. But it's a broken relationship. The second aspect that really um, uh, comes out there as well is the broad and shared opinion of very authoritative voices within the judiciary that this president has not been good with the law. 
including today, by the way, the court mm. basically declaring Again. unconstitutional his executive order, which appeared to restructure the, the judiciary in in terms of where the, they fall in the biggest uh, structure of government and um, the idea that the judiciary would kind of somehow in whichever way fall mm -hmm. under the state law office that the court basically you know rebuffing the president and saying uh, you can't do that i mean that the president has no business telling the judiciary where they fall and everything and that that line ought to be respected and some people would say i mean that looks like a very basic thing in terms of just the uh, separation of powers as we know it even for non loyally minds like like some of us have you get the sense that uh, there's something that's not working uh, for the president in terms of either the kind of legal advice he's getting or he's taking because uh, i mean those things are not looking good if you have every single day it is difficult to believe that the judiciary just has an agenda you know to keep throwing out everything concerning the president there has to be a question that one then asks what's not working is it that um, um, someone doesn't see these things beforehand even if they look like they are hidden in plain sight that's something that doesn't make the country look good and something you said lena switch um, I, I thought about a little bit, just as you were saying, that wouldn't it be neat if we had, you know, because these are resources that we have in the country. These are people who served in the, in the highest office that exists in the judiciary, and a, a whole arm of government. These are two former CJs, um, and there would be other people in this society, former speakers like the Ole Caparos mm -hmm. and all of these things. Wouldn't it be great if we had a, a, a system through which um, as a country, we tap into the wisdom of these people and their experience to make sure that the conduct of government business is actually orderly, that we don't get ourselves in a situation like this. I mean, imagine even the image that we have out there in the world where two respected former CJs, because the two gentlemen, quite fr frankly, are respected around the world, yeah. that they actually come out and speak and say what the president is actually violating the law. It doesn't look good for the country, Yvonne. And yeah, it doesn't clarify, Yvonne, uh, yeah. if you can just allow me to quickly uh, re respond to the issue you are raising, which is the breakdown of traditions. You see, traditions are not written. And what all these episodes are pointing at is the fact that we do not have norms, certain practices that are not written, that give us or show us the boundaries uh, of the conduct of, of public officials, such senior officials like the president, chief justice, cabinet secretaries, and things like that. Because you will notice the president quoting and saying, um, I was given information by state organs. It never used to happen that way. We know very well the president gets briefs. Sometimes we are told daily briefs from the intelligence. Is that information you want to share that I have received that information? There's something that is dying about the customs that guide uh, governance, and I think that's what you, you, you have very ably illustrated there, Joe. Hey, wow. Um, Yvonne, yes, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just um, going to say, <laughs> It's, it's, it's a tragedy that you know, all of this is happening. And I think particularly many of the cases that have um, uh, been decided by the judiciary um, against the executive and particularly the office of the president with respect to decisions that have been made. Um, and by this, not just you know, on this, there's been you know, quite a number of other issues. Um, you know, the one on CASs, the one on the recent uh, parastatal um, you know, appointments that were made. And not a good way for the president's last year. He's got, what, now 13 months, um, or yeah, maybe exactly a year to, to, to the end of his, uh, of his tenure. And um, it leaves the president exposed with fighting these battles with the judiciary when he should be focusing on other things like you know, legacy and like projects and like which of those are the ones that are uh, the most profitable, that you know, have provided the most jobs or the most value for money, um, or where are we with the economy coming at a time when there's issues like 
like COVID that he has to deal with, uh, which is something bigger. And yet here he is um, on a collision course with the judiciary. Um, particularly more so during the last year of that. Um, and when you have a former Chief Justice or Chief Justice Emeritus making such, um, and I, I want us to, to play that um, soundbite of uh, Chief Justice Emeritus talking about what Parliament should do to a president such as this. And it clearly tells, I think, all out, including that stinging letter that was done by, you know, former CJ Mutunga. I mean, what was that, the pettiness of impunity? And, you know, it, it was rather stinging. But here's a no-holds-barred statement from Chief Justice Emeritus uh, David Maraga on what Parliament should do uh, to the president. Watch. It is the duty of Parliament when the president has violated the Constitution to, to take steps and, re, and remove him. To impeach the president. To impeach the president. That is the only way you can, you can have order. If this kind of act is allowed to continue, we are descending into a banana re republic. But then there's order and traditions that uh, Linus was talking about. And um, the Chief Justice, I, I think, had a lot to say, not just about the president, but about everything. The traditions and the norms that we're talking about, the position of a majority party, a minority party, or in the old dispensation, what we called um, you know, a ruling party and the opposition. How did it come to this? Could it be also uh, due to what we have with the handshake that was now done three years ago? Maraga did speak about the role of the opposition and whether they should also take uh, their fair share of blame for the situation we find ourselves in in the country. I'd like us to listen to now um, Maraga on the opposition. <laughs> the opposition has died. And that is what has given uh, the president the audacity to do what he wants. The opposition <laughs> who, are, who are now in the, in the handshake should condemn this, this act of the president and tell him. They should be the first ones to tell him, look, Mr. President, we are with you, but this one, no, 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 you are not doing the right thing. Please hear what the people of Kenya are doing. Yeah. That's what one would expect the, the, the opposition to tell the president. Mm. Yeah, so just my last statement, it's an upheaval of norms and traditions and, and laws in the country that has probably led to where we are now at, I think, the height of tension between, if we thought the revisit was, was a problem, this is problematic. And remember those cases at the Court of Appeal yet to be heard and determined whether they go to the Supreme Court, it's... It, we're Fra not Francis, Francis, you have been quiet for a while, but I'm just thinking about Chief Justice Martha Coleman right now. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I listened to that interview by by KTN with uh, Justice Maraga, retired uh, Chief Justice, and I could not help but notice the anger with which he spoke and some level of disappointment. And I also thought, could it also be that, one, the disappointment is institutional and personal? <laughs> Personal in the sense that here is a scenario where 41 nominees were recommended by the Judicial Service Commission that he chaired, and for two years, the president did not say anything about them. Court orders came, none and was he, and complied And he kept pushing with. Maraga himself. Yeah. Four times, yes, Yeah, right? or thereabout. Yeah. And barely a week, or do I say two weeks into... Less than, actually. In, into the term of uh, Chief... Justice Mother Kome, it is a decision that has been made by the president, <coughs> albeit with some um, discussion uh, and a, deb a new debate about the six nominees. So at a personal level, probably he would feel slighted because why is it that the president probably didn't even uh, appoint those even 34 judges or, or even all of them at that point. But well, well, if, if I'm in a series to be believed. Yeah, uh, he said he, all he, or none. He says that Maraga said all or none. All or none. But, but, but at least you could see some movement in that direction, which I would think, in my own personal opinion, was somewhat a slight, and goes on to confirm that the relationship between the president and the uh, immediate former chief justice was not the best. Number two, I, I, I look at it in the, in the context 
context of you know that institution of the judiciary um the relationship between the head of the executive and the head of um the the, the judiciary was not the best but i also found it a little suspicious um the chief justice once uh, recommended or advised the president to dissolve parliament and now the chief justice emeritus is saying that parliament should have um, should have uh, impeached, impeached the president I, I saw some you know I don't know whether it, it's a contradiction of sorts but I, I listened to, to him and I saw some arguable point there um, so should parliament have been impeached in the first place or not? And should parliament have impeached the president or not? That's a different matter altogether. Secondly, parliament as an institution, the framers of the constitution, did they envisage a situation where we will have a parliament that is in government? Or was it a scenario where the executive will implement policies? The judiciary will arbitrate disputes. Parliament will legislate and oversight. Um, I don't think it would have been a scenario where only Parliament is expected to play that opposition role. And maybe it's a misnomer what we had before this constitution and what we have now in the whole understanding of it. Because even though we have the minority and the majority sides in Parliament, the expectation is that Parliament will be the eyes and ears of Kenyans. Um, insofar as the other two arms of government are concerned. So yes, parliament has a role to, 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 to play, but the overall function of parliament, the way I would think about it, is to number one, make sure that the laws that are passed are top notch. Number two, the resources that have been allocated to all levels of government and all agencies are well managed. So I look at it in that context. But more fundamentally, do we have an opposition as we knew it before? Not currently, and more so after the handshake. So he has an arguable point there that probably the death of the opposition as we knew it then has, to some extent, compromised the level of oversight for this government, um, both uh, at the county level and at the national level. But now, Chief Justice Martha Kome has a huge task on her hands. How she navigates uh, this very rough terrain is important. And more so the relationship between herself and the president for this one year or so, and the remainder of her term mm. with the next president, number one. Number two, it is not also true that a good relationship between the president and the speakers of the two chambers of parliament, the president and the chief justice, is unanimity in decision making mm. or unanimity in points of view. Mm. They can disagree, but in a way that does not stall operations in the executive, in parliament, and in the judiciary. So if there is that feeling that the judiciary is making judgments and rulings that stall operations in the executive, or parliament is slashing the budgetary allocations that are to go to the judiciary, then you have a relationship that is not forward moving, forward looking, but vengeful in nature, which is not good for the people of Kenya. Because if a judiciary is not functioning, if the executive is not functioning, if the executive is not implementing the project, then the three arms will fight at that top level, but bottom line is that ordinary people will suffer. And a judge, a ju lastly, a judge uh, told me uh, last week that uh, if you file a case today at the Lands and, em and Environment Court today, the earliest you can be had before the appointment of these judges was in three years. So that also tells you the number of cases that have been pending. There are people who cannot do anything with their pieces of land. Why? Because there's a dispute that have been lying there for three, four years. Why? Because we don't have sufficient personnel. People who file cases at the Employment and Labor Relations Court do not have solutions. Why? Because there was a shortage of judges. So while the acrimony at the top may make news, the bigger problem is on the ground. Yeah, but, but Jamila, there's the whole thing of uh Fine. The the news uh, CJ um, in some respects has, uh, has 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 caught something. On the one hand, in the sense that uh, uh, whatever role she played, um, she suggested she didn't have a role in uh, 
um, the whole swearing in and all of these things that uh, a lot of people have argued with that but that's what she said in her statement but be that as it may here we are with a situation where she seems not to dis I mean she seems not to agree with what the president did uh, at least she said that in a statement on the night uh, that uh, I think the evening of that same day that the swearing in happened and then uh, 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 the statement said that uh, the JS, no one is allowed to interfere or to yeah. tell the JSC yeah. or the judiciary. No person or authority is allowed Allah. to direct the JSC or the judiciary in the execution of their mandate. Yeah, which, which was basically just saying, you know what, uh, what the president did was um, uh, not within the four corners of the law, to, to be put simply. Uh, but what happens after that? Because she chairs the, G the JSC, um, to which this ball apparently has mm -hmm. now been thrown. But we haven't had anything from that institution. We haven't had the JSC take a position on this issue because right now it is the JSC's reputation that is at stake. They have made a decision according to how they understand their mandate. Uh, granted that some of the members there uh, were not there before but the truth of the matter is that here we are with the JSC that is uh, essentially um, uh, on the cross as it were these are the people who uh, according to the Constitution are supposed to interview these judges are then supposed to recommend mm. those names for appointment to the president and they did exactly that and then the president said well I am sorry but I can't appoint these uh, six people you deal with it is the JSC dealing with it? Is there anyone who is telling us now the JSC received that uh, information, memo, whatever from the president, this is how this thing is moving forward? Because who is that person who is going to communicate with the country? I mean, there are all sorts of court cases and, 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 and fiery statements coming from the Mutungas and Maragas of this world. But the place where the real information is supposed to be coming, uh, they are not saying anything. Uh, Lina's you look like you've had something. I want to say that. I think all this time, uh, Lina speaks. No, 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 no okay, say that. Jamila. <laughs> no, 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 Jamila, go ahead. No, it's fine. It's fine. No, Please go, go ahead, Jamila. Yeah, yeah but, it, but just a quick one, uh, Jamila, as you um, check this up. 166, Article 166, has several times been described as having no reverse gear. <clears throat> and it's actually true, which is what Chief Justice uh, Martha Kome was saying that after submitting the name to the president, after submitting, submitting the list to the president, the JSC becomes factors official. It has no further role in it. Now, what does 166 say? It simply tells the president Shana. to appoint in accordance with the recommendations of the JSC. So the ball you are talking about, you spoke of the ball being passed. You can't pass the ball backwards. That only happens in rugby. I, sh I, sh I should use that word that they uh, use in law, purported to have been passed backwards. <laughs> but, but, but that, I mean, at least they would say, like, we haven't seen that ball that you guys are talking about. I would have expected that, like, where was it thrown? There's no Strictly way to... Strictly interpreted 166. Yeah. You can't pass the ball back. And, and when uh, Justice Mar former Chief Justice Maraga yesterday spoke about this and he pointed that out and he said, you, there's no reverse gear. And um, to him, he said a statement that, that uh, for me really resonates until today. He was asked, how would he remember this president? And he said, you'd remember him as a president who had no regard for the law. And for him, the worry was um, um, what that means for now, all the other officials in government, and the fact that they see the president has no regard for the law, it will mean that they'll, they'll follow the same path. And that's what he was talking about, how he worries where the judiciary will be if this is the trend. But something else that he spoke about yesterday was when he mentioned that there could have been some change in the names that uh, had been forwarded, the six that were rejected, according to the ones he had seen and, and the eventual ones that were gazetted. I think uh, we should listen to the soundbite on Maraga talking about the names. If it pleases your excellency, it is now my humble duty. The names have, have changed. All of those, them? those who know, those who, who are, were said to have issues, uh, and some have been added now to that. I mean, to that list, and others have been removed from that list. If it was a bona fide allegation, why is this a shift? 
Yeah, he questions that, and he said he's aware, at the time when he was Chief Justice, he's aware that there were some judges whose conduct was questionable from what he was told by the president. But what he says now is he doesn't understand why the names were changed. And he speaks a lot about how um, the word he used, we have lynched. He said, we have lynched the six judges in the public eye uh, without following due process. And for him, due process means appoint them and then now go through a tribunal if there are any issues uh, about them, let the tribunal listen to them and judge, uh, and, and, and judge them. And I think um, for, for Justice William Mutunga Gashiri was speaking about how um, passionate he was speaking and how disappointed he seemed. He spoke about a range of issues. I think one of the things that for him um, is important going forward is the independence of the IABC. Because he talks about how our elections, even when they were making the ruling in 2017, he said they looked back at how 2007 was mm. to make that ruling in 2017. And he talked about how initially, he says the initial um, idea for the BBI was elect to, to, to make sure that we don't see what we always see during elections. But in his opinion, that has been forgotten. I think we can listen to him speak about uh, the handshake and the independence of the IBC. If we don't get an independent uh, IBC, <laughs> and we have uh, electoral frauds uh, committed in the next election. Whether the, the constitution will have been amended and you have uh, uh, the, the, the position of the deputy, I mean, of the prime minister, deputy, two deputy prime ministers and others and all, and all that, mm -hmm. we will go back to uh, problems still. But let me ask because you, yeah. what needs to be addressed, what need, needs to be addressed is to ensure that we have an independent electoral and boundaries commission, a commission which will uh, whose results which which will uh, carry out the elections, mm -hmm. and everybody will, uh, will will accept that the results are, are what they are. Yes. The entire purpose initially of the of, of the, the handshake mm -hmm. was to say okay. We have uh, violence all the time after every election. Yes. Let us uh, deal with, with it so that we, we don't have a repeat of violence every time. Mm -hmm. um, but the BBI has taken a different trajectory. The issue of electoral fraud is not paramount. From the time of the handshake until, until the other day is when they are, they are, they are, they are appointing the IBC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the, the, the she was talking about. They said it's not paramount. He even talks about what the Krigler report said that the IBC fully constituted should be in place two years to an election. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 he talked about BBI and and um, he actually agreed actually and 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 that part of the reason why two of the judges who were rejected, uh, Justice Ngugi and Justice Odunga, could be because of the BBI ruling, the ruling that rejected BBI by the, by the five uh, judge bench, when he was asked in that interview by KT News, he said yes, he believes that that could be a reason. So that perception that we had last week, I'm talking about why these guys were not um, were rejected, See, former Chief Justice David Maraga says that that could be one of the reasons why these guys were in, the, in, in that list. He refused to say which were the original names that had been there in the original list that he saw when he was Chief Justice. Uh, and that list, that list, that's interesting because even the former, the, the former Vice Chair, Chair. Mas, 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 yeah. was also quoted as saying the same thing, that, well, uh, there were some queries that were raised, even if it was still then after the fact, but that list was slightly different from what, what, what is being floated right now, which would raise very interesting questions. And indeed, uh, so for me, the question is, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. One of the things, like you said, Joe, is we need to hear from the JSC. Um, they have been silent, I think, on two key issues that have taken place since uh, that uh, verdict uh, by the five-judge bench on the BBI. There was an attack on judges. We. Um, haven't heard anything from the JSC um, as it's fully constituted with a statement from them. Um, and then we've heard nothing from them on this matter. So there's allegations that are flying around from somebody who was in the JSC, from a former chief justice who headed the JSC, particularly during the time that this vetting was done, and still nothing from the JSC. What would be interesting to hear from them is this information that the president says has come to him. Was this information known during the time that they were conducting the vetting and the interview process? If so, what did they do with it? Um, or did it happen 
afterwards. But then I'd also like to say that um, in some ways, I think perhaps we have heard from the JSE. The Chief Justice is also the head of the JSC, yeah. right? And in her statement, she said, amongst those things, that no one has authority to direct the work of the JSC in the execution of their mandate. Um, but then that she also did say, I believe in her role as Chief Justice and as pres uh, head of uh, the JSC, that there is no reverse gear. What we've been saying, upon forwarding of the names uh, to the President, the Chief Justice and the JSC become functus official. So perhaps we are starting to hear in little ways, um, you know, from her and maybe by extension from the JSC. What happens now is she has to walk a tightrope. So does she begin an all-out aggression with the president knowing she's got a year with him and then another nine? Or how does she play those cards? And I think she's in that tough position where she has to figure out what her tactics will be. It is easier for uh, you know previous chief justices. And I think it's also important to mention that there have been others who've made statements on this. No doubt the chief justices former um, have bigger weight, but the Kenya magistrate and judge Judges Association also spoke out against this. Uh, we heard from the Law Society of Kenya, including the Mombasa chapter. But then where do we go from here? I know we've got two minutes. Can we quickly play the soundbite by President Uhuru Kenyatta, where he said, I think during the swearing in of the 34, mm -hmm. uh, where he said, I also took an oath. And this, I guess, gives an indication of how this goes going forward. I too took an oath to both the letter and the spirit of the law and it is not open to me to turn a blind eye to reports of our state organs. As long as I serve as president, I will choose the right over the convenient, I will choose the hard over the easy, and I am not doing this for myself, but for the people of Kenya and for posterity. What it is, is that you know, he will not budge on his position. And remember, he has no incentive whatsoever to conclude with this matter. He could even decide to not tell us what this information is. He's got a year to the presidency. It took him two years to even appoint the 34. What's in it for him to tell us anything or move this process forward? Doesn't matter. He's not up for re-election in 2022. So here's the president saying, won't budge. I won't budge. And now, the law saying there is no reverse gear. So where we go next, I think, is, is, is going to be interesting. And, and, and Linus, is this where we still say the law is very clear? <laughs> because the president is there. I mean, he's talking about the, the constitution. Which constitution? Um, two former CJs and a host of other people, Yvonne listed them, are saying he has violated. Actually, I don't know whether this is still about the law or it is about management or handling of, uh, of this situation. Because to me, what, is, what this is amounting to is mismanagement of a very, very important uh, national affair. Because I would not even have found it necessary to have the president say the things that he was saying on the day he was um, swearing in the 34 uh, judges, saying I also took the oath, and as president, as long as I serve as president, there is an element of no people there, in my view. Mm. Like, I am the president, you are not. So I act this way. And, and, and that doesn't come across as right, which is why I keep talking about traditions and, and norms that don't really allow the president to talk about his powers, his responsibilities, or even his uh, state organs that he's, he's citing here. What happened to the, um, the, the issue of, of, of back channels? Because you look at the handling of not just this issue of judges, but also the issue of even IEBC uh, vacancies. How long did it take for the president to declare them uh, um, Three years? Vacant? It? it took Two about three, three years. years. Yes. The very, very critical <laughs> position of uh, Auditor, Auditor General. Nine months. How, how long did it take? Nine, Nine months. months. So there is, uh, I, I don't know whether this is the constitution oh, or it's just. a tradition. Yes, a, a tradition or a management style of, of the president, which is introducing a lot of gaps in terms of just um, how he does things. And what this has meant is, with places like the judiciary, is run straight into trouble with, uh, with, with, with not just the, the immediate former, but 
uh, the yeah. two, two, two former uh, CJs. Yeah. Joe, um, I, I'm looking at the statement by the Chief Justice uh, um, on the 4th of June 2021. There's a paragraph here that on 11th January 2014, the JSC recommended the appointment of 25 nominees as judges. And on 27th of June 2014, the president initially appointed 11 of them and subsequently appointed the remaining 14. The difference <coughs> then and now is that the 14 who were not appointed okay. together with the 11, there was no question. statement, question. question raised about their integrity. So it was a batch of 11 first and then 14. But here is a scenario where out of 40, 34 have been appointed and sworn in but six not yet. But the statement from the presidency was clear that questions have been raised about um, those six. Now, unlike 2014, I highly doubt there will be a scenario where the, where the president will appoint them. Because the question that will follow next is, what became of the integrity questions that had been raised? Yeah. Have they been resolved? And how have, been, have they been resolved? And what is this threshold of resolving them that has come now such that they are now ready for appointment or no longer have the questions that have been raised, number one. Number two, was the evidence or the adverse information about the six nominees presented to the Judicial Service Commission? If it was, what is it? And what does JSC do with it? Do, does JSC proceed maybe to recommend establishment of tribunals to clear the six nominees. If they will be cleared, they will be, they be appointed. If they are not cleared, then they be um, exited from the judiciary. Those are some, the fundamental issues that have, be, have to be dealt with. But as it is now, the six nominees, as we said here again last week, are serving in the judiciary. Four are currently high court judges. One is the high court registrar. The other is a chief magistrate. So if there are integrity questions about them, does it mean it is integrity questions for their elevation to the next level? Or are there integrity issues that can suffice at this level? They can be tolerated at the high court level. They are bad, but they're not too bad. Yeah, they're the bad, but not too bad. <laughs> OK, bad for the next level, but not too bad for where they are. And lastly, as we speak now, Many people will look at the six nominees from a very, or from a very suspicious point of view. Mm -hmm. What is it they could have done? There are all manner of rumors that are spreading, from terror issues to akashas to everything else, to issues of corruption. There are all manner of allegations that are being made. So, and because it is not clear who is accused of what, so you look at one and you say, "Ama uyundi yulewa," or probably it is this one. So I think the easiest way to deal with this is to table the evidence because what is the worst that can happen? In any case, suspicion and questions have already been raised out there. So table the evidence and say, this is what we found in relation to so and so. And this is what we found in relation to so and so. Probably this something that was raised about them um, and not necessarily maybe even BBI if that is the case. So the easiest way to deal with the rumors is to, to table the evidence, let the public deal with that information. And as Jamil always says, take it home. Let's take it home. And we actually, I think, are starting with the that very Jamila. <laughs>